So the other day I was listening to a podcast with Eli Kipchoge shortly after he'd just broken his own world record at the Berlin Marathon. And I was left thinking, wow, this guy works just as much on his mind as he does his body. He's mastered many mental skills that have helped him do things that no one thought humanly possible. And if you want to perform your absolute best, then you'll have to become equipped in a range of mental skills that are used by the world's top performers. So let's run through five of these skills to see exactly how they've helped some of the world's best performers reach peak performance. In 2008, Michael Phelps was on a mad one. Not that kind of mad one. A mad charge towards clearing up as many gold medals as he possibly could at the Beijing Olympics. Four years earlier, he had won four golds and two bronzes at the Athens Games. But this time, he was gunning for eight golds. He had already cleaned up his first three golds before then going into the 200 meter butterfly final. But during the race, things didn't go exactly to plan. His goggles started filling up with water. And by the last length of the race, he was racing blind as he couldn't see anything at all. But for Phelps, this didn't matter because for years outside of the pool, he had worked with his coach on his videotape. His what? Phelps' videotape is where he would sit alone and visualize every stroke of every race. For hours and hours, he'd imagine how his arms and legs would work in tandem to help him glide through the water. He knew exactly how many strokes it would take to complete each race. So when crisis struck, he wasn't phased. He just put in the videotape mid-race and went on to not only win gold in this race, but also break the world record. This is the true power of visualization, running through a mental script so much so in your mind that you are ready for any possible outcome during your performance. In essence, it just allows you to expect the unexpected. In the Euro 2020 final, England and Italy battled their way through to a penalty shootout. Italy led 3-2 in the shootout and Jorginho, one of the best penalty takers in the world, stepped up. If he scored, Italy would win. The camera panned to England's goalkeeper, Jordan Pickford, and it showed him mouthing the words, no problem. Pickford then kept his focus on Jorginho's run-up to predict the right way and save the penalty. Now, of course, Italy will go on to win this final. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not. But Pickford could hold his head high in that he saved two penalties during that shootout. And his mouthing of no problem to himself is a prime example of self-talk. We've all had the failure grembling bark sh to us during some high pressure moment, causing a million negative thoughts to run through our minds. But self-talk, particularly that which is vocalized, can cut through all this negativity. It forces you to just focus on the words that are coming out of your mouth. And that's what allowed Pickford to keep his cool and not worry about how pressurized the situation was. Self-talk doesn't have to be shouting motivational mantras in the mirror. It can just be very simple trigger words to help calm you, ground you, or get you geared and ready for an expected outcome. And expected outcomes can only come about if you have goals. And the thing with goal setting is that it has to be realistic. Otherwise, you're just going to end up getting very quickly disheartened and disillusioned when you don't meet your expectations. The GOAT of basketball, Michael Jordan, offers the best example of realistic goal setting. It's well known that MJ was cut from his high school basketball team. At that point, he didn't even have the goal of reaching the NBA. That would have been delusional at that point. Instead, he was very deliberate about setting short-term goals. After getting cut, he set the next goal of just getting back into his high school team. And then he set the next goal of becoming a starter. And then he set the next goal of going to a division one college. And then he set the next goal of getting into the starting five. And then the next goal of winning a national championship. And only then would he set the goal of making it to the NBA. Yes, you may want to have the ultimate end goal in mind, but if that's all you have to focus on, you'll quickly lose interest because those goals are so far off and require so much effort that day to day, you don't even feel like you're making progress. Focus on stepping stones, not leaping rocks, um, if that even makes sense. But I think you get the point. Small goals, ladies and gents. On October 30th, 1974, 1 billion people tuned in to watch the Rumble in the Jungle, the iconic heavyweight championship fight between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman. Foreman was the undisputed champion with an unbeaten record, and Ali was past his best. At 32 years of age, he was seven years older than Foreman, and everyone thought that Ali would not be able to withstand the sheer power of the champion. But Muhammad Ali had a plan. From the second round onwards, he spent the majority of the fight leaning up against the ropes and covering his body, now famously called the rope a Here he would lie in wait for Foreman's onslaught of punches, each time blocking them with his arms covering either his face or his body. Ali would then get a few shots in here and there after Foreman had expended so much energy. Ali knew that going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Foreman would result in himself tiring and just being exposed to Foreman's vicious haymakers. So he stuck to this strategy with an unrelenting focus and discipline. This was a secret plan he told his fans that he had for the fight. It went completely against Ali's usual style of using movement to counter opponents. Some considered it a crazy idea to keep taking shots from the most powerful of punches in the game at the time. But Ali did not waver. And in the eighth round, Foreman's punching and defense became ineffective. 
He was exhausted. Ali took advantage of this to land a combination of punches that caused Foreman to crash to the canvas. Against all the odds, Ali had done it. Some call it the greatest sporting win of all time, and it was because of his ability to remain laser focused on a plan. A plan that could have very easily gone out the window the second Foreman landed his first punch. All of these stories about all of these skills have one common thread. Each of these skills feeds into an overarching skill, one that is perhaps the most important there is if you're to perform your absolute best, and that is emotional regulation. This is simply keeping your shit together for every second that you're out there doing your thing. Michael Phelps' visualization allowed him not to panic when his goggles filled with water, and instead he controlled those feelings by following a mental script that gave him certainty in what he had to do. Jordan Pickford's self-talk helped calm his nerves so that he wouldn't dive too early, just like so many other goalkeepers do when facing penalties. And Michael Jordan's goal setting gave him a target to keep moving forward and not languish in feelings of anger, frustration or despair at getting cut from his high school team. And Muhammad Ali's unrelenting focus allowed him to not bite earlier than he needed to during the fight that most people around the world thought he would lose. Regulating your emotions is tough and it's something that doesn't happen overnight. But if it's something you want to get better at, then check out this next video here as a starting point.